Hello, I'm Yoram Chazoni, and this is NatCon Talk. Today I'll be speaking with Joshua Hammer. He is opinion editor of Newsweek magazine and a research fellow in American constitutional law at the Edmund Burke Foundation, the sponsor of this program. Josh Hammer, welcome to NatCon Talk. It's so great to be with you, Yoram. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate your joining us today. It's just two weeks after the Capitol riots in Washington, and a lot of people are still reeling from those events. Why don't we open by getting your view on where we stand today? Well, quite a difficult question to get us started on, of course, and so much to unpack there. Um, you know, you're, we're recording this one day before uh, Joe Biden is set to be uh, inaugurated as the next president of the United States. And, you know, look, from a 35,000 foot altitude perspective, you know, kind of taking the higher view, the next four years could be a bit of a, 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 a sad place for conservatives, right? I mean, obviously, after the Georgia Senate runoffs, the Democrats have a 50-50, uh, technically a slight majority, I guess you would say, in the Senate with Kamala Harris's tie-breaking vote. But uh, I, there, are, there are silver linings. You know, if we go to the 2020 presidential election, not a single incumbent House Republican lost. It's a pretty remarkable statistic. And, you know, the media, all the pollsters, everyone said that Donald Trump was going to get absolutely annihilated in November. Now, we can on the one hand say that, you know, his rhetoric about a stolen election was uh, a, a little much. And in particular, I thought his his arguments about, quote unquote, overturning the certification process on January 6th were unconstitutional and frankly egregious. But holding that aside, he totally outperformed in November relative to what all the pollsters and what everyone had expected. You know, I, I, I'm currently living in Colorado, but I moved here from Texas. Texas is a fascinating state to break down this election. If you go down to the Rio Grande Valley in Zapata County, Star County, these, these heavily Mexican-American counties right on the Mexican-American border, 80, 90% Hispanic, many of them broke outright for Trump. And some of them he improved, if he didn't win outright, 20 to 30, if not 40 points over his 2016 margin. So we see the inroads of what a lot of people on the right, you know, our friend Orrin Cass at American Compass, uh, so Rob Amari at the New York Post, a lot of people are kind of getting on board with this notion that there seems to be a more working class, multiracial, multi, multi-ethnic conservative coalition that's set to emerge. Um, we could probably unpack this a little bit. To me, it actually has kind of o- overtures of Benjamin Disraeli's One Nation conservatism to kind of borrow from a specific Anglo analogy and parallel. But I think the our work arm over the next four years is to kind of build this movement. That is our work, is to kind of get this movement off the ground, to add substantive and intellectual heft to it. The policy wants will have to turn those, those concepts and intellectual ideals into concrete policy proposals. But I think the blueprints are there for a genuine conservative revival and coalition. And we never expected Donald Trump to get us the whole way there. He was in many respects a wrecking ball. He was a much needed wrecking ball. He was a wrecking ball who kind of demolished the outmoded stale pieties, you know, that had kind of, uh, they had kind of spread like weeds across conservatism Inc. for decades. And and a lot of these kind of prudential policies had become kind of uh, hardened into pieties that no longer applied to present circumstances. So to that extent, he was deeply beneficial. But, you know, now he probably should go away. At this one, he probably should go away. To your credit, Yoram, that was, of course, your wonderful video that you produced for NACON Talk about the Capitol Hill riots. You and I are in complete harmony and accord on that sentiment. But now the hard work begins. Now the hard work begins of actually taking that wrecking ball and turning it into something, something substantive going forward. And for that reason alone, I actually, despite everything going on around me, try, try to and more so, I think, not only try to, but usually am somewhat optimistic about our future. Okay, I, I want to get I want to push push you on on a number of things that you just said. But before we uh, get into that forward looking, uh, really refreshingly optimistic uh, view that you're, you're you're offering us, I I do want to uh, just uh, tarry just a little bit longer uh, to get your view on uh, on the Capitol Hill riot. Look, it's absolutely appalling. You know, I briefly turned into the president's rally. Um, I turned it off after a few minutes. It seemed to me to be nothing particularly different from kind of his normal uh, election or even post-election stump speech rhetoric. Um, I I thought it was deeply irresponsible to hold that rally in the first place, especially after uh, Republicans and I prior had lost 
uh, the two Senate races in Georgia. And let's not forget, this was literally, you know, 12 to 18 hours after those Senate races seemed to be over. So I thought the decision to hold the rally in the first place was very irresponsible. The rhetoric struck me as kind of quintessentially Trumpian. But obviously, the decision to hold that rally, some of the specific things that he said about kind of going to the Capitol and fighting, you know, I mean, at some point, what do you think is going to happen? If you have a lot of people there who have been told for months that the election is quote unquote stolen, who have been told specifically for months that the vice president has this kind of extra supra constitutional quasi divine uh, a notion to single handedly unilaterally overturn this, uh, the state's electoral college return. I mean, this is just nonsense. I mean, I'm a constitutional lawyer by training and this is just total absolute nonsense of the highest order. So peddling this, that, that specific lie, and that's what it is, it's a lie, was horribly imprudential and terrible. And obviously the way that he conducted himself in terms of, uh, you know, uh, failure to immediately condemn and failure to immediately call off uh, the, the people who were inside the Capitol, it was just a very depressing spectacle. And I, I was very depressed that night. That actually was the most depressed I have been probably uh, in at least two or three years of kind of being in the weeds of, of this sometimes sordid business. And it, it, it wasn't it was a galling kind of shock to the conscience. You know, I, I mean, I, I consider myself a, a, a law and order conservative. I'm a very pro law and order conservative. I take very traditional conservative views, I would say, on the role of law enforcement, the rule of law, incarceration, uh, things of that nature. Um, and, you know, you know, the same way that I immediately and unequivocally condemned all of the Antifa Black Lives Matter riots that shocked America's urban corridors last summer, I, of course, immediately condemned what I saw at the Capitol. So it, 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 it truly was appalling. Um, and it was, I would say, from a constitutional law perspective, quote unquote, impeachable. I think it clearly is. An, what, what The way he acted was, quote unquote, impeachable. Um, impeachable, according to the U.S. Constitution, is defined as, quote, high crimes and misdemeanors, which Alexander Hamilton defines in Federal 65 as, as effectively being synonymous with uh, a, a, an abuse or violation of the public trust. So you don't need to commit an actual criminal law offense. It's more of a kind of a loftier kind of uh, breaching of the public trust of the statesman's duty to the citizenry. And I, I think it clearly qualifies. I, I happen to oppose this impeachment process on prudential grounds, but it was... Um, it was probably the first truly demagogic day of Trump's presidency. Um, it was something that I think um, a lot of his critics in 2016 feared. It took four years to happen, but um, that was a demagogic day that we saw on January 6th. Okay, and you say that it's uh, you, you you don't support impeachment, but uh, you think it's time for uh, for for Trump Trump to go. I think a, a lot of your views have been pretty solidly with uh, with Trump's. Policy instincts and 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 his uh, uh, his overall uh, approach uh, in a lot of ways, but now you're saying it's time for him to go. You know, if he cares about the movement that he's kind of kicked off, if he cares about what we were talking about, you know, a few minutes ago, if he cares about uh, that, actually building upon the wrecking ball that he produced about kind of turning. Uh, market fundamentalism, laissez-faire dogmatism, kind of like Wall Street Journal editorial board, tax cuts are always best policy. If he, if he cares about kind of turning that, you know, the John McCain, Mitt Romney Republican Party, if he cares about kind of turning that and turning the page over and um, turn the Republican Party into a more cohesive nationalist vehicle to represent kind of the working and middle classes of the country, then I think it will be prudent for him to now, you know, go down to Mar-a-Lago and uh, in West Palm Beach and kind of just play golf and get out of the sordid game of politics. But I, I, I am skeptical that he will do so. You know, if there's anything that we know about uh, President Trump. And like you said, I, of course, a, a agree with the overwhelming majority of his of the policies that he's implemented. But if there's anything we know about him, it's, you know, it's that he definitely has a larger than average ego, I think would be a diplomatic way of putting it. So I, I, I am skeptical that he will immediately go away, but I think that he ought to do so if he cares about this kind of progression of the conservative movement that I think uh, he consciously has actually helped get off the ground. I think probably we should throw throw into thinking about this the fact that, you know, we, we got to see, all of us got to see four years of uh, the Democrats uh, trying to uh, sabotage, to, to mount a resistance, to sabotage the Trump presidency. And uh, there's, you know, there's an awful lot of 
uh, resentment against uh, for for what Trump was was up against, and and I I think on on the right a lot of people still sympathetic to him because of that. How do you react to that? Look, I I, I could not sympathize with this more. I I, I really could not. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about Trump outperforming the polling. You know, look, I I remember less than a week before the election, there was an ABC News Washington Post poll that I think showed Biden beating Trump in, in Wisconsin, a key battleground state, by 19 points. It might be, it might have been 17 points. It was 17 to 19, somewhere in that range. He, he ended up winning, if not mistaken, by considerably less than one point. Um, that takes skill in, in, in a kind of a paradoxical way to botch your polling by that much. And I say that just because that is just one microcosm. That is kind of one proxy for this broader notion that for the past four years, every institutional actor imaginable, whether uh, the media, the academy, uh, the Fortune 500, woke capital, big tech, which I'm sure we'll get into a little later, they have all been ducks in a row lined up against him. The, the Mueller report, Comey, I mean, uh, Russia, like all of this nonsense, they have done everything possible to try to slow down Trump, the first impeachment, of course, over that Ukraine phone call, a phone call that produced in PDF form is five pages. I mean, was it like the, was it the greatest diplomatic phone call of all, of all time? No. Did it deserve a months long impeachment process? Of course not. But so they have done everything imaginable to gum up the works and slow him down. And he has had all the odds lined up against him. What's more than that, I actually do agree that there were far more than usual peculiarities and irregularities in this election process. The proliferation of mail-in balloting is kind of inherently destabilizing. Mail-in balloting, just by its very nature, provides ample more opportunities for ballot harvesters and malactors to kind of, uh, for fraud. I mean, just, let's just say it, for fraud. And in fact, I, I wrote a little piece, a very short piece after the election, kind of comparing this, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's mail-in ballot rejection rate for the general election with their rejection rate for the primaries, where there was a huge discrepancy. The rejection rate was substantially lower in the general, in general election. And I basically just said, why is this? And no one to date has responded to that article. So I, I continue to have some reservations. The key point here from um, a US constitution perspective is that the processes for, for airing those grievances are, are, are multifold. One is of course the courts. But even in a system where the courts let down their duty, and I actually agree that some of the courts here did let down their duty, the Pennsylvania litigation in particular should have been heard at the Supreme Court. The Fourth Circuit had a very bad ruling in North Carolina about uh, the, the, bureaucracy, the bureaucracy there changing its election laws midstream. But even when that happens, the remedy the Constitution affords is for the various states to submit competing slates of electors to, to the Electoral College. But the problem here is that the states didn't really get their act together in time. Even the Republican controlled legislatures did not do so. So on December 14th, which is the day the Electoral College sends in its results, there were not competing slates of electors, which there have been in some previous elections, such as the election of 1876. That didn't happen here in any single state. And that really was kind of, at least for me, the nail in the coffin date. This notion that after that, this January 6th certification process with Mike Pence overturning, that's just nonsense on stilts. So I, I deeply sympathize with everything you're saying, but this very specific notion that this that the kind of ritualistic, symbolic certification of the votes was a time to kind of air these grievances, I think is unfortunate. So w w when you look at this, y you're saying, look, the Republicans didn't succeed in uh, in mounting a credible constitutional uh, effort to to audit the the election. They 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 tried it. They failed. Is is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. The problem really goes back, frankly, months before the election. From my perspective, uh, I mean, as soon as the the COVID pandemic hit last spring, Republicans should have easily foreseen the proliferation of mail in balloting uh, and the fact that these various state legislatures and um, election bureaucracies and democratic governed states in particular would seek to kind of glom onto that you know it, it, it's well, if wait, I, do a quick wait, I think it was foreseen i i remember reading you know lots and lots of essays in which people were saying that exactly this was going to happen 
I, I, I recall some of those essays too. I guess my question would be, if it was so easy to foresee, then why weren't Republicans doing much of anything about it? There should have been more lawsuits filed at a very early stage. It, it, it seems like the Democrats caught Republicans kind of off guard here, despite the fact that I do think a lot of conservatives kind of, at least in the media, and kind of the public landscape foresaw this. It seems to me that the relevant actors on the ground, the lawyers, the the party activists, et cetera, were not actually doing the, the, the work that was needed. So I think that's part of the issue. But part of the issue is, of course, what you're saying here. And you're talking about, of course, post-election. And, you know, uh, look, a lot of the judges, um, the federal judges who kind of shot down these various challenges, a lot of them were, were Trump-nominated judges. Um, uh, you know, these were not kind of uh, universally across the board, kind of uh, leftist, living constitutionalist, partisan judges. So they, there certainly were some of those. Um, but it, 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 overall, it does seem to me that um, there should have been a more, a better orchestrated legal effort from start to finish. And it seems like that failed. And I, honestly, I was sympathetic to the Electoral College argument that the remedy was for like states like Arizona, Pennsylvania, these states where the election results were contested with Republican legislatures. They could have held, um, they could have convened meetings, they could have convened tribunals, commissions to investigate the results. And if those results came out in their favor, they could have actually submitted a competing slate of electors to the Electoral College. But they didn't do that. Um, so given all of that, the president's conduct, I think after December 14th in particular, which is the Electoral College uh, deadline, was deeply irresponsible for a national leader. Okay, so it, it, it sounds to me like the Republicans really did blow it. Now, let's, let's talk for a moment about uh, that January 6th, uh, the symbolic procedure in which uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Congress was going to certify the, the, the new president, Joe, Joe Biden's election. Now, th there is a constitutional procedure whereby uh, senators and congressmen can at that point object to uh, to to uh, sl slates of electors from from some of the states, and at at this point we're hearing that uh, that those senators and congressmen were who were uh, in, involved in this, uh, Senator Hawley, Senator Cruz, and others, that uh, that what they did was um, seditious. There was an uh, a, attempt to overthrow or, you know overthrow the elected government. And uh, that we as responsible people should be uh, l looking to make sure that, that people like, uh, like Holly and Cruz are, are no longer a part of our public life. You've already said that, that, you know, that as far as you're concerned, Trump's actions were sufficiently irresponsible. So that your per preference would be, you know, for, for, for him to, to hold back and let other people take over. W what about these accusations against these uh, young senators of uh, of the Republican Party. So, you know, I it's easy in retrospect to say, um, I, Senator, you know, there's slightly different scenarios, right? Senator Hawley specifically was objecting to the results in Pennsylvania, which, by all indications, was probably the most egregious example, um, because the the Supreme Court did kind of uh, clearly and unequivocally breach its own state law by extending the receiving date for 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 postmark mail-in ballots until after election day. Um, the, the process there was particularly fraught. Um, Senator Cruz, obviously, kind of slightly differently, kind of teamed up with some fellow Republican senators to kind of, uh, he wanted to convene an 1876 style election commission. You know, it would have been, that commission idea, I think, would have been better if it had been proposed, you know, a month ago, or a month prior to when Senator Cruz did that, perhaps in December. But this notion that uh, senators have blood on their hands or are somehow culpable in any way whatsoever, for, as you accurately noted, exercising the tools at their availability to kind of air a debate about the elections that were clearly, I think, irregular at a bare minimum. Um, this, is, this is total nonsense. I mean, it's a total misplacement of moral culpability of individual agency of the people who actually breached the Capitol walls, who brought zip tie um, into the domestic terrorists who went into the Capitol looking to kind of to harass or kidnap legislators. They don't, uh, Holly Cruz and the congressman who, who, who agreed with them, 
they, I, from my perspective, they share no, uh, they share no culpability whatsoever for this. Now, I, I the certification process, um, I, I call it ritualistic and symbolic, which I think, which I think it is. I, it, 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 the case in which it wouldn't be symbolic is where they, where the states would actually send competing slates of electors. Then it would be up to the Congress to actually debate which is the authentic slate to certify. In a situation like this. Arguably, it's imprudential to air the concerns at that point after the states have not done their job in sending those complete competing slates. But I think that's a prudential point. That's not a legal point. And I and I deeply respect the views of those like Senator Cruz and Hawley who thought that that was the time to kind of air this public debate. So they are using the constitutional tools at their disposal. Um, I, I, I think I, I, the rhetoric of President Trump at the rally was deeply irresponsible, as was, as we said, the decision to hold the rally in the first place. But from a legal perspective, I thought Trump's issue or his biggest issue on January 6th was not necessarily what Senator Hawley and Senator Cruz were doing, trying to kind of air state specific debates about the procedures and the returns and fraud and whatnot. I thought President Trump's legal error, again, in contrast to his rhetorical and other errors, his legal error was kind of spouting off this point that Mike Pence had unilateral authority to just put, basically put a thumbs up or a thumbs down to say, you know, Trump's reelected or Biden's not. That's that's just not how it works. I have been talking to an awful lot of people in uh, in the United States, particularly on the right. I, I, I have to say people people are pretty down. It's not terribly surprising. Uh, a lost presidential election, lost lost the Senate. Uh, but I, I think that there is, you know, beyond the usual uh, reactions to to a, a stinging electoral defeat, I think there's a great deal of fear. I, I, I'm talking to a lot of people who uh, who are, are are worried that it's never going to be possible to hold a a free election in the United States again. Now, I, I I should emphasize this is not this is not the first time we're hearing this about an American election in 2016. Uh, the, pretty much the entire Democratic side of you know of, of American politics uh, insisted that the election had been. Uh, had been stolen, and an uh, awful lot of people were, were were afraid because of that. Now we have the same thing on the Republican side. It's something that uh, is 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 very difficult to watch. You know, nothing like anything that 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 uh, we've seen seen in our lifetimes. What do you think about this question? Is it possible for Americans to go back to having? Uh, reliable elections, elections that most people on both sides would trust? And if so, how are we going to get there? So this is one of the most important questions coming out of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, utter uh, utter nonsense that was the 2020 election in many respects. Um, look, if we don't have electoral legitimacy, then by extension, you lack lowercase r Republican legitimacy, you lack self-governing legitimacy, you, you cannot survive as a free nation, as a free self-governing people, if 40%, 50%, whatever the current public polling shows of the citizenry has serious grave concerns about the legitimacy of the electoral procedure. So this is without question, one of the most important uh, questions that Republicans, capital Republicans will have to address moving forward in particular. Look, I think if there's any national mandate, and I, I kind of hesitate to speak of national mandates, it's kind of one of those overused tripes in American political discourse, but if there's any quote unquote national mandate to come out of this election that would kind of help the common wheel and kind of help national unity and healing and help us kind of come together as, as, as one people under God in the kind of classic, classical American formulation, I think that we really need to implement a probably a national holiday for an election day each November. Um, and, and, and the flip side of that is that we would get rid of mail-in balloting, we would get rid of early voting to the absolute extent possible. Of course, there will be exceptions for active service military, there'll be exceptions for the bedridden elderly, for the chronically ill. There, there will always be dispensations from any sort of legal rule that's imposed. But personally, I support that something along those exact lines. I, I, I make it a holiday, give people the day off work so that no one can complain about voter suppression or having to kind of adjust their hours or anything like that. Make it a national holiday on election day and then also get rid of these inherently destabilizing mail-in balloting procedures, early voting, which has all sorts of its own issues that also has proliferated like none other in recent years in American elections. 
that is personally what I see as the best path forward. I presume Democrats will oppose that with all their might because they know that the mail-in balloting process with ballot harvesters and all that that entails necessarily redound to their political and electoral interests. So I, I, I'm not particularly optimistic that this will happen in the next few years. I, I, of course, it's a matter of civic efficacy, America's constitutional amendment process, and this might require a constitutional amendment, uh, is deeply, deeply fallen. We, we've effectively lost our ability to pass constitutional amendments, which is itself quite sad. So um, query whether this will actually happen, but um, that is certainly one of, one of the policies that I will be pushing adamantly over the next four years or so. Okay, so one one side of it could be uh, electoral reform in the technical sense, but of course another part of the issue is that we you know we we, we all got to see the interference in you know in the election a few weeks before the election suppressing uh, suppressing reporting by the New York Post, which took place uh, online, and uh, and then in the aftermath of the of the the, the Capitol riot. Uh, Donald Trump himself, the president of the United States, was uh, uh, unceremoniously uh, removed from uh, almost all of the major uh, social media platforms. And so so the, there, there is another side to this, which is that public debate uh, doesn't take place in the way that it took place 10 or 20 years ago. T public debate now takes place on private platforms. No major... Um, social media platform is uh, is sympathetic to the conservative side. How do you see this? Well, this is perhaps the greatest. This may well be um, the greatest issue of our time, actually, um, is how to rein in out of control private corporate actors who have, uh, in the case of the technology companies and social media in particular, have been both immunized, legally immunized, and delegated the responsibility of policing and moderating what is, in any meaningful sense, the 21st century equivalent of the old public town square, the commons, if you will, from uh, colonial America or England or anything like that. And the, the difficult problem for conservatives is twofold. One is, one is kind of overcoming this notion of market fundamentalism, this notion that private sector action is per se good and that it is quote unquote conservative to just let private sector entities, corporations, uh, technology goliaths in Silicon Valley just do what they will and that any sort of regulatory action will diminish incentives for entrepreneurship, ingenuity, innovation, all these things that capitalism has historically valued. And then the other problem um, is that, you know, conservatives in America have traditionally been the strongest defenders of the Constitution. But the, the U.S. Constitution, which you and I are in strong agreement on this, is just a wonderful, wonderful document. It is a wonderful document for liberty, justice, and all the things that politics has traditionally cherished and prioritized. But the Constitution is primarily about state action. Well, I think the 13th Amendment, which is what abolished uh, slavery, it, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's the only provision in the entire Constitution that speaks of private conduct. Um, the rest of it is about state action. So unless we can find a way to kind of conceptualize um, these technology companies as state actors, which we actually might, there was a wonderful recent Wall Street Journal out there making this exact argument so that these companies' actions have made them quote unquote state actors and therefore they can be regulated under existing kind of constitutional and legal doctrines. But unless we do that, we need to think of new ways to regulate, of new ways to kind of reclaim free speech um, for the sake of, of preserving free speech. But the issue here is actually, it's, it's actually even broader than free speech. I think conservatives make a mistake actually when they limit their limitations about the current big tech siege or, or, or the big tech purge, I should say, when they limit their complaints about that to just quote unquote free speech concerns, I think they're actually under, they're undercutting themselves. The issue here is, is, is even broader. The issue here is effectively leading to a broader purge of the public square in general. And we see this, of course, of course across all of the formerly liberal and increasingly illiberal institutions of power, the woke capital, New York Times with the Tom Cotton op-ed, Simon & Schuster canceling Josh Hawley's book deals. We see it over and over and over again, of course. And unless conservatives become comfortable with from my perspective at least, forthright, unapologetic, and assertive use of state power 
to reclaim the common good from unaccountable corporate actors that have that have both seized and been willfully delegated in short side fashion by legislators themselves, the ability to police the town square and things like that. Um, less until that happens, conservatives will be politically irrelevant in America. So I, I, I am, tr in, in some of my work, I'm trying to lay the foundation, and, and I know you are too, Yoram, of trying to make conservatives more comfortable with this and get them out of this notion that private sector corporate action is per se good and need not have any connection to the common good or the national wheel. Well, I, I just, I find it a little bit difficult to, to, to understand how, how property, property rights became an absolute. I, I mean, uh, American constitutional jurisprudence, uh, you know, I was in high school when they, uh, when, when, when they, they, they taught us about, uh, the, uh, uh, the the Supreme Court ruling that if uh, if uh, if a corporation owns a town, that that doesn't mean that they can do everything that they want in uh, in in the town, right? I mean the uh, the, the the idea that uh, that railway lines or uh, telegraph lines uh, are subject to certain regulation, even if they're privately owned, because of the fact that uh, that. Uh, Public communication and public commerce takes place uh, in in those privately owned vehicles. Um, I, I I'm I'm not sure that that's such a such a new thing, is it? No, I don't think it is. Um, I, I if I recall the Supreme Court case you're talking about about the uh, private town is uh, Marsh versus Alabama, and, and and that precedent that is a meaningful precedent. Actually, humorously, that precedent actually came up <laughs> at our Shabbat dinner discussion just this past Friday when we were discussing all these issues. So that is a I would say that's a very legally relevant case for the, for present purposes. Um, you know, I, I, our friend Michael Lind, who I, I think is one of the great voices of the present era, it's just a prolific essayist, a, a brilliant mind. Um, uh, he, he had a piece at, uh, at Tablet, the online magazine recently, and he basically said that this actually is really not all that complicated, that we already have the tools available that are needed to label these companies accordingly and make them legally liable uh, to, the, to the extent that we need to do so. And the two mechanisms for doing so are, quote unquote, common carrier regulation, which is a term normally applied to railroads, airlines, and things of that nature, whereby uh, the railroads and airlines cannot uh, discriminate, essentially. Uh, they, they effectively have to take your business. And obviously, there are dispensations for this. There's the you know, fly list and things of that nature. But that's kind of the broad baseline rule. And the second tool that Michael Lind mentioned, besides common carrier, is public accommodation, which is this idea from the 1964 Civil Rights Act uh, you know, that hotels, uh, inns, motels, restaurants cannot discriminate against you. And obviously, in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the exact context was race, of course, but uh, the, the statutory language was broader. So Michael Lynn basically argues that through common carrier regulation and or public accommodation requirements, the tools are actually already at Congress's disposal to effectively mandate that these companies cannot discriminate based on political viewpoints. And there are any, there are any other number of specific tools as well, of course. There's a Section 230 reform, which is a, something that has gotten a lot of airtime over the past two years. Senator Hawley's been pushing this aggressively, and that pertains to the social media company's specific uh, immunization from liability for, for deleting uh, content. There's antitrust. There's, there's any number of, of remedies here. But it, it, it seems to me that if conservatives can get past some of their uh, misbegotten priors, some of, some of their kind of vestigial inclinations, if you will, to just let private sector business just do its thing, the uh, consequences uh, be damned, then it seems to me if they can get past that, then the tools are there for meaningful reform. But we have to act sooner because the longer that this festers, the worse conservatives will get purged, the more rancor and resentment will fester among conservatives across the country. And the closer we get, it seems to the brink of a pretty ruinous conflict from my perspective. This, uh, this argument about, uh, about property rights is not, it, it really is, it isn't something new. Uh, conservatives, uh, American conservatism since the 1950s and 60s uh, has had this you know, a familiar divide uh, between uh, li libertarians and uh, traditionalists. Liberals are people who are primarily concerned with life, liberty, and property. 
and think that if you have correctly constructed your regime for protecting life, liberty, and property, then you've done everything the government needs to do. And you'd be best not going into, you know, a, uh, 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 you, you'd be best not going into other areas. Government doesn't need to involve itself in other areas. So that that's a familiar tr liberal today called libertarian position. I, I don't think I don't think that traditional conservatives have ever been willing to uh, to accept that point of view for the simple reason that that the the things that uh, human be the principles that human beings need in order to uh, lead political life are they simply are there there are more of them and they're more complicated than simply life liberty and property so here here we have a a super example where every conservative that i know wants to go a very long way to protecting uh pr private pro property and, it, and it's it's kind of insulting to to keep hearing you know libertarians uh, accusing people like uh you know, like like uh, uh, Josh Hawley uh, and and uh, others who are talking about the, the common good. Well, they, they keep getting accused of being just like the socialists. I, d I, I don't see how they're just like the socialists, but it is true that conservatives have always thought that these principles need to be balanced against one another. And here we have a case where private property is uh, uh, is is one basic liberal right. And uh, free speech, freedom of speech, freedom to, to uh, of political speech or of any speech is another basic uh, liberal right. And how can you possibly judge between the two of them? There's no. It doesn't seem like there's any way to judge between the two of them, except through trial and error and the construction of a a tradition which changes with circumstances. Um, when the circumstances circumstances change, and that that of course is the the, the traditional uh, position of Burke or Selden or other conservatives who say uh, f freedoms are crucial, but they have to be balanced against one another, and it's and 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 it's tradition and prudence that we need to do it. Yeah, so much great stuff there to unpack. Of course, um, you know our friend. Uh, Johnny Burke, uh, when he, he he recently left American Conservative to take over uh, ISI, Intercollegiate Studies Institute, in his kind of uh, intro letter uh, to members, alumni, uh, donors, not entirely, not entirely sure who his audience was, but it was really exquisite, wonderfully crafted letter. And one of the things that Johnny kind of saluted President Trump to, which I also would salute President Trump to, uh, is whether consciously or inadvertently, he has kind of forced conservatives to kind of reassess the relationship between quote unquote timeless principles and prudential time and circumstance specific policy judgments. I think a lot of what, you know, the various American institutions of conservatism, Inc., uh, the national reviews of the world, I, in, in the post-World War II, kind of post-William F. Buckley, post-Frank Meyer fusionist era, of American conservatism, I think a lot of what we were kind of all sold as were uh, as quote unquote timeless principles were really no such thing. They were kind of circumstantial prudential applications of conservative principle applied to defeat the Soviet Union primarily. Of course, you know, this conservative movement in this form kind of reached its apotheosis during the presidency of Ronald Reagan, which of course is closely intertwined with, with the defeat of the Soviet Union. But uh, more broadly speaking, Yoram, uh, I, I kind of come back to uh, another friend of ours, uh, David Bragg, who in his wonderful uh, uh, essay in the current American Affairs issue, David Bragg basically says that, um, you know, Ed, Edmund Burke knew Adam Smith, okay? I, I, Edmund, Edmund Burke was a fan of Adam Smith, in fact. But while Edmund Burke and conservatives of kind of that first generational era, if you will, kind of formative conservatives, they believed in this Adam Smith notion of the wealth of nations, but Edmund Burke believed in the wealth of his nation above the wealth of nations in the plural. This, of course, is kind of the early American Republic debate between Alexander Hamilton on kind of the industrial policy pro-American side uh, versus Jefferson on kind of the, the more Francophilic universal natural rights doctrine side. So a lot to unpack here. But the point is, um, yes, if you talk about the need for, for some sort of government action to kind of channel private activity, to kind of channel 
market activity, which is just an extension of private activity towards the common good, towards justice, towards human flourishing, the kind of classical ends of politics as the years have known them for thousands of years, that does not make you a socialist. I mean, uh, or, or in Cass of American Compass was, uh, he did a recent, uh, I, was, I watched the webinar, it was a Wall Street Journal webinar. Uh, it, he, he was paired up against George Will, who previously himself had called Orrin Cass a socialist for essentially supporting industrial policy. I, I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, does that mean that Alexander Hamilton was a, was a socialist because of his opinion or his reports on, on, on manufacturers in 1791? I mean, this is just total nonsense. Um, and, but we're going to see this debate play out over the next four years. We're going to see kind of the three cheers for capitalism crowd compete against the two cheers for capitalism crowd. Irving Kristol, as you and I both know, was a two cheers for capitalism kind of guy. That strikes me as the Burkean prudential conservative place to be. I, I, I love capitalism. I would never want to live in a country with exorbitant taxation rates. I would never live in a country that is trying to regulate my private enterprise out of existence. But this notion that government activity is here, there, and everywhere wrong when it tries to kind of channel private activity towards the common wheel and health of the citizenry, that might be liberal, but I have a hard time buying that it is conservative in any meaningful sense. Now, you, you actually had an exchange with, uh, with uh, uh, another common friend of ours, uh, Ben Shapiro, who uh, I have to say surprised, surprised me by, by writing an essay against against the concept of uh, the common good. And I, you know, I, I find that very, very difficult and very, very surprising. I'm not sure wh where and when uh, American public philosophy reached the point where uh, everything is so privatized that there is no concept of the common good. You and I have talked about this before. I mean, it, uh, the, the, the preamble to the American Constitution uh, speaks about establishing justice and about uh, ensuring the general welfare. In fact, the entire preamble is pretty much about uh, the common good. H how did we get here? It's a really great question. Um, I, look, I struggle with this. You know, I mean, even at kind of the quote unquote flagship institution of conservatism, National Review, I mean, I mean, Rich Lowry, of course, did write a book making the case for nationalism. So there, even within the quintessential conservatism inc institutions i think there are some people who better align with with you and i but there are many who, who do not um heritage foundation where i where i continue to continue to have friends and i would never throw heritage under the bus but they hosted one event a little over a year ago in late 2019 it was just an hour and a half just railing against nationalism i mean your name certainly came up in that event numerous times uh it was it was just very sad to see and you know look i I think it is just because of what I was kind of talking about earlier is that a lot of these prudential applications, um, and look, you know, after FDR, FDR obviously was present for a very long time in America. The New Deal was a very sprawling, extensive program. Um, and, you know, when Jack Kennedy became president of the United States in, in, in 1960, which was around the time the National Review, Frank Meyer and fusionism were really kind of taking office, I, if I'm not mistaken, the highest marginal tax rate around that time was upwards of 90%. Um, that is not a country that I would want to live in. And at a time like that, it would be deeply prudential to propose probably something closely approximating massive tax cuts and probably massive deregulation. But so many of kind of like the old, the old hats, if you will, kind of the, the old geezers, for lack of a better term, of conservatism, Inc., as they grew and matured, they failed to realize that what made deep sense at a certain time and place might need to be adapted for a different time and place. And I think, again, that is, the, that is kind of this wrecking ball phenomenon that Trump was in 2016. He came in and he really demolished or at least made people deeply question a lot of these old beliefs. And I, I, I actually profoundly do thank him for that. I really do. Let's now shift gears just a little bit. Uh, the one... Uh, institution of uh, in, in, within American government that has not recently passed into the hands of uh, of uh, Democrats or, or or Democratic appointees is the Supreme Court, and uh, of course the Supreme Court has been an an issue that uh, you and you know many of uh, many of others have thought deeply about for for an awful long time. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that the the the, the American Supreme Court has been 
uh, pursuing some some kind of systematic uh, liberal agenda at least since the 1940s, certainly since the 1960s, and it, it's been kind of a you know revolutionary institution. In you know, we 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 mentioned pornography. We could we we uh, we could mention uh, uh, free speech, uh, but. Uh, and, and, and certainly in, in everything having to do with civil rights, uh, religion in the schools. There's so many areas in which uh, by the 1960s, the American Supreme Court had, had taken it upon itself to, uh, to remake the United States. And as, as uh, uh, I, I guess Christopher Caldwell would put it, in fact, to, to propose and implement a, a, a new constitution for the United States in a lot of ways. Now, what, what, what do you think uh, about the efforts of the American conservative the American conservative movement to try to move judicial appointments to the right? There is such a thing as legal conservatism. Uh, it it it's a surprisingly organized thing. The 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 training and the vetting of young lawyers who are then then uh, brought up to become. Uh, Potential nominees to the the court system is probably never been more organized than it is in the United States on the American right today, and yet it's not clear that it's working. Yeah. Um, so look, I I am quite literally a card carrying member of the uh, American legal conservative movement. I, I literally in my wallet I have I think my Federal Society ID card that has a Hamilton quote from Federal seventy eight right on the back of it. Um, you know, I was I was a three year Federal Society board member at the University of Chicago Law School, and I continue to do Federal Society speaking engagements um, today. Now, having said all that, um, I, like you, have some serious kind of criticisms and reservations about the state of, quote unquote, legal conservatism in America as it's existed for the past 30 to 40 years. And I actually wonder if simultaneously also here, there's been a bit of a conflation between prudence and principle. Now, the, the early, uh, the Federal Society, which of course kind of the embodiment of American legal conservatism was founded in 1982 as more or less a direct reaction to the excesses of the war and court era from 1950s and 1960s. And, you, you know, again, we can go back to 1940s and the Everson case in particular, but it really does start to get truly dire during the war and court uh, in the 1960s, I would say in particular. But kind of the early era of American legal conservatism when uh, you know the term originalism kind of first came into the public discourse in American constitutional theory, it was really heavily predicated upon judicial restraint and judges being closely tied to the positivist, true original meaning of the Constitution. Now, I I wonder if we fast forward thirty five to forty years now after that, whether. Josh Hawley is actually correct, as he said on the Senate floor the day after the Bostock ruling, that was the Title VII ruling last June, uh, when Justice Gorsuch wrote, uh, I, thought, I thought an abominable opinion for a 6-3 court effectively reading sexual orientation and transgenderism into the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I, I wonder whether Josh Hawley was right when the day after that he said that if the terms are originalism and textualism got us here, if what do they mean? I, this is not conservatism. So one of one of at least one of two things has to be true. We can always do the kind of no true Scotsman thing, right? We can say that uh, Neil Gorsuch did not properly apply textualism, did not properly apply uh, originalism. In that particular case, I I agree with that. I I agree he did, he did not. But the flip side, and not necessarily in opposite to that, but these two concepts can kind of go together. The flip side is I think we should wonder whether conservatives, legally and judicially speaking, have been fighting with one hand tied behind their back the whole time. The, the, the reality is that living constitutionalists, progressive legal theorists, make no pretense whatsoever of being tied to the Constitution. They, of course, support outcome-oriented jurisprudence that aligns with progressive substantive end goals of politics, sexual liberation, individual autonomy, all, privacy, all, all that. Conservative, legal conservatives ha never talk about substance. They never talk about the ends of politics. They never talk about the national good, the common good, borders, anything, religion, any, any of the substantive ends that politics in its true form ought to be about. So one of the things that I'm trying to do, and you know, we, we've obviously discussed this um, at length off camera, 
is I'm trying to develop a, a slight twist on originalism that better aligns with substantive conservatism that I view as still being tethered in the constitutional text, not removed from that, so it retains legitimacy. Um, and I, I call it common good originalism. It's kind of the, the nascent emerging theory. Um, There's going to be an essay in this May's issue of a uh, Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, which will kind of be the the coming out party, if you will, I guess, um, for this for this theory. Um, and I, I and it's already caught on a little bit with people I've talked to about it. And and and, I, and I'm optimistic that there are enough people in my federal society fellow traveler universe who are also kind of disheartened at the state of what has happened that they also might kind of latch on to what I'm proposing. So I'm actually, despite our dire straits uh, in, in, in legal conservative worlds and Justice Gorsuch's betrayal in Bostock and all of that, I, I actually am personally optimistic that uh, people like me are trying to rethink outmoded orthodoxies in the legal context, just like folks like you and Oren Cass and a lot of our other friends are doing so in the political context. Well, let, let, let's talk for a second about what common good originalism would would be. I mean, to to begin with, when we're talking about the common good, uh, we're not talking about just any common good, right? I mean, this is the common good of the nation, the common good of a particular polity and you know its institutions, its people, and its traditions. Is is that right? I mean, you can't you can't be talking about the common good of the entire planet and be a common good originalist. Have I got that right? Uh Totally correct. Uh, as as John Eastman like loves to say, the preamble of the Constitution be, doesn't begin with "We the people of the world." It begins with "We the people of the United States." So totally correct. The original originalism. What was conservative about it? It was it was based on the assumption that since the people who wrote the Constitution were in you know on on almost every issue more conservative than uh, than than recent generations. All you had to do was figure out what it was that they meant, and then you'd get a much more conservative constitution, right? So, but I read Bostock just like you did. I mean, I don't have the legal training, but uh, I I I know a, um, a a forced argument when I see one from philosophy, and it's uh, it's one of the most tortured pieces of writing that that I, I've ever seen. Now, the the Civil Rights Act in 1964 was not written by people who were conservatives. I mean, it, it's a liberal piece of legislation. It was uh, written by liberals for liberal ends. And, uh, and, and, and all of that's just fine. But no one who was involved in writing it could ever have imagined, and, and not only that, but I think it's extremely unlikely that they would ever have endorsed the kinds of things that Justice Gorsuch is able to find by uh, uh, playing logical games with the text, which should, to my mind, it seems closer to deconstruction than anything else. Tell me, what do you think he did wrong? Why is he not a common good originalist? So th there's numerous ways to approach this, obviously. Uh, I, it really is a truly tortured opinion. Um, he, he commits numerous errors. I mean, let's just start at, at, at the top. Um, the opinion is, uh, to the late Justice Scalia's credit, to what he repeatedly condemned as literalism. It is taking a term totally divorced from the social context in which it was written, totally divorced from uh, the intent of the, of the legislators, what, what Blackstone and, and, uh, referred to uh, as, as the ratio legis, uh, the will of the legislature, totally removed from any of those considerations whatsoever. And he kind of takes this term uh, out of context in the abstract. And here we're talking about the word sex, uh, you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. And he takes the word sex and uh, transmogrifies it into concepts that would never have even been envisioned by the legislators who enacted that. And in the concept of trans transgenderism in particular was had not even been theorized yet or not even really been conceptualized yet by gender studies professors in the American Academy. Um, so th that is what Scalia and I think a lot of other uh, legal minds would call literalism, not quote unquote textualism. Furthermore, what he's clearly doing is he's, tr is he's willfully imbuing his normative priors into, a into the word sex, but those normative priors are not the normative priors that you alluded to of the, of the, of the United States Constitution preamble. They are not the normative priors of justice, general welfare, human flourishing, et cetera. They are the normative priors 
of sexual liberation, of individual autonomy maximization. There's nothing conservative about this. He is choosing to kind of read those values into this term. So that is many things, but it is certainly not conservative. Um, and just, uh, just, just a final point to kind of tie it into what I was saying earlier here. I think one area where conservatives or legal conservatives have made a mistake, uh, Scalia did this actually a lot. Scalia would always kind of condemn the notion of legislative intent. He would say you can never kind of divine the will of a, of a legislative body. And that may or may not be true, but surely we can go back and look at what the legislators thought about a piece of legislation. Um, the clauses that have to be before the statutory text where they explain the purposes of the legislation, the teleology of the legislation. Surely we can consider what they were trying to accomplish. And that ought to affect how we imbue with meaning the words in the statutory text itself. Uh, Justice Gorsuch did nothing along those lines whatsoever, I think, in Boston. You know, it's funny, the, the, this kind of uh, assumption that you can you can detach a text from the assumptions on which it's based it reminds me of you know of our earlier conversation about uh, about libertarianism where you, the, the assumption is you that you can de detach the government of a country from the social assumptions on 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 which it should be based it's it's the same kind of thing there's a uh, the, there's an attempt to say the state can be neutral the law can be neutral, and neutral turns out to mean that, you know, just just as you said before, that that when the left comes to read it, they're going to uh, impose their own own values on the economy, or they're going to impose their own values on the constitution, and supposedly the right is not supposed to be doing any value imposing, but what happens if it turns out that that's impossible? And that there is no way to interpret a text without imposing values. Then the only question is, are you imposing values that are actually resemble the the original values, or are you imposing values that are, you know, just made up? So you nailed it. Um, thank you for that. that. That is a that is such a crucial point, point. Um, and that's actually a point that I made in my first much shorter common good originalism essay from last May. Was I said that. It, as you just said, it is a, it, 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 it's a lie against human nature, I think. It, it, it is a lie against human nature to pretend that human actors, fallible as we are, can truly, without any priors whatsoever, just quote unquote, neutrally interpret anything that we read. This is hogwash. Uh, the same way that I think it is impossible to be a truly neutral legislator when you're trying to craft policy or legislation, I, I think the exact same principle holds for the judicial branch, for the branch of government that, that, that is interpreting our legal text. We're not capable of doing that as human beings. So the question, again, is whether conservatives um, in the legal context will fight with one hand tied behind their back and just preaching nothing whatsoever other than positivism and procedure, um, while the left is not even making a pretense of doing so or whether we will tether substantive argumentation into the text of the constitution itself. Um, I, I think, I think the, the latter is a much better uh, approach. I think we'll be, it, it better aligns with not just our policy goals, but I think it is actually in a more profound kind of Burkean sense, the more conservative thing to do in the first instance. I've been kind of thinking that at a time of, uh, Intense crisis. I mean, we really are we, we we really are seeing the mutual loyalties that have held together, you know, the the uh, the the greatest uh, republic, the greatest democracy in the world uh, for uh, f for the last century and a half. We're seeing those mutual loyalties coming apart, and we really don't know where it's going to go. Right. I mean, I I, I think that there's uh, reasons to think that the left is going to overreach. And uh, and that there's going to be a backlash, and that that backlash may come sooner than anybody thinks. But but you know things really really don't don't look very good. And at in this these kinds of circumstances, I, I have this impulse to tell younger people, well, all right, look, it's true that you can't you know you you you, you can't change the government of the United States by yourself. But if you want to uh, put down roots and create something solid. Um, how about uh, how about going to synagogue or to church? How about 
uh, you know, building a local community? How about uh, uh, getting married and, and having kids? You know, it just seems to me that uh, that people who are are looking for stability have some of the tools for doing that, and that a lot of what we're seeing is uh, is young people who are uh, frustrated and scared, and uh, uh, and so you know rejecting all of the old. Uh, all of the old wisdom about what you're supposed to do when you're frustrated and scared. And they seem to be turning themselves into lonely, isolated people who are much easier to, uh, to go after. What do you think about these, these issues, the connection between the political and the personal? So, you know, leading American statesmen have never thought that America could endure uh, without without religion. Uh, Washington says this expressly in his, in his farewell address. John Adams famously said that the Constitution was made for a, a uh, religious and moral people. It was never made for anyone else. And what's more than that, American leaders have kind of always conceptualized America. And you're, you actually might slightly, slightly disagree with this, but American leaders at least have always really thought of America as uh, not only being deeply inspired by the Hebrew Bible and the story of the Israelites, um, but as perhaps being kind of uh, divinely looked after. Um, certainly, you know, Benjamin Franklin famously proposed um, Moses' parting of the, of the Red Sea as the, as the national seal. It was ultimately not chosen, but that was a robust debate. Abraham Lincoln, who's my favorite uh, American political figure in, Amer in America's history, uh, famously spoke of America as a, quote, almost chosen people. Um, and it, we actually talked about this, um, a friend here in the Jewish community, we, we, we discussed this at, at Shabbat lunch just last Saturday, and she basically said, you know, I truly believe that God looks after this country, and that we're going to be okay, because it's in it's in God's hands. And I, I, I do ultimately share that. The issue is that in order to share that you actually have to believe, <laughs> you, you know, you have you have to actually be a believer in, in, in the first instance. And, you know, any number of people have lamented, of course, about the precipitating uh, church attendance, synagogue attendance. There's the rise of the no affiliations and Pew and Gallup surveys of Americans. So, you know, look, one of the greatest things that could happen to America, of course, would be some sort of uh, 21st century great awakening, right? Uh, maybe, maybe after a pandemic like COVID-19 would be a particularly propitious and natural time for such a great awakening to take place. But especially, it's true, in, in young kind of American conservative circles, there is kind of a rise of kind of a neo-paganism, if you will, of, of true uh, uh, heathens who do, do not subscribe to traditional Christianity, traditional Judaism. Uh, there's the pseudonymous online personality known as, quote unquote, uh, Bronze Age pervert, uh, who was quite an online phenomenon within the past couple of years. He has a lot of followers. Certainly the people who stormed the U.S. Capitol are not men and women of faith. I find that extraordinarily hard to believe. So, you know, look, I do think that um, America's fate ultimately is um, in God's hands, you know, in, in Hashem's hands, as uh, we would say in Judaism. And, 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 and for that reason, I personally am not too afraid and not too scared about our future. Um, but you have to get to a point where you actually believe in that. Um, and I would only encourage, uh, you know, people my age who uh, do not have any sort of notion of belief, any sort of faith or religious or, or community or any, any of that to, to try and find that because it, 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 it might be a way to kind of heal your wounds. I, I have a problem with the, you know, with the insistence of, look, I don't believe, so I can't, uh, so I, I can't go there. I, I, I think most people um, start out on these kinds of journeys. They start out confused. And so, of course, they don't believe because they're confused. The question is whether, whether, whether a person is willing to do something like picking up the Bible and starting to read it seriously, whether a person is willing to go to a church or to a synagogue and find a teacher who appeals to them. I see young people who talk to me about this as these things as being, um, I think that they're afraid. Just like they're afraid to get married, 
They're afraid to go to serve in the army. They're afraid to have children. They're, they're also afraid to pick up the Bible and start reading. They're afraid to go to church or to synagogue uh, and, and make the effort. And I think that that, that hesitation, that fear, uh, is much more important than the lack of faith. Because it, we're, we're talking about a paralysis that keeps people, even, even if they say, yes, you know, I, 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 I kind of agree with you, I think that would be good, but they still don't, you know, they still don't buy a Bible and start reading. They still don't start attending services. And I, it's hard to understand what that, what that issue is, but I don't think that it's lack of faith. I think that it's some larger kind of fear that prevents them from taking any action to save themselves. Yeah, well, no, I, I, I find it hard to disagree with that, of course. Uh, maybe what we're seeing here is kind of just the logical end game of, of, of liberalism, of this notion of, uh, of, uh, of this notion that all you have is yourself, free will, individual autonomy kind of taken to its absolute extreme, that only you are in control, that the communities around you don't matter, that the teleology of the world and the universe and, and the most meaningful things ultimately don't matter. Uh, I, I'm very open to to the notion that that is what is happening here, and it, that would kind of vindicate Patrick Janine's whole book, actually, right? I mean, that's kind of more or less what Patrick argues, is that... Um, uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, is just kind of summarizing in a, in, a, in a sense Patrick's book, and Patrick is obviously certainly onto something there, even if I don't agree with everything. He's very much onto something. But you know, from the realm of public policy, um, which I guess is more my kind of professional bread and butter, it certainly seems that there are very specific tools that governments can and ought to be doing to try to remedy these crises. We obviously should be more emphatic about promoting family formation, about incentivizing and promoting marriage. We need to get the Bible back in schools, school prayer. Um, you know, obviously this notion of separation and church and state, as you and I both know, is utter egregious historical revisionism of the most awful sort, has no pedigree whatsoever in our tradition, is certainly not required by the First Amendment. Um, so these, these, are the, these are sort of basic policies that we should and ought to be encouraging, I think, as national conservatives. Um, but look, I, 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 you are onto something here. And I, I, I guess I intuit that as kind of being the logical end game of, uh, of a particularly desiccated, uh, slightly pagan form of liberalism taken to its logical extreme. Josh Hammer, thanks so much for joining us on NatCon Talk. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for joining us for another episode of NatCon Talk. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss us next time.